Welcome everyone to another episode of Working People, a podcast about the lives, jobs, dreams, and struggles of the working class today. Brought to you in partnership with In These Times Magazine and The Real News Network, produced by Jules Taylor, and made possible by the support of listeners like you. Working People is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. If you're hungry for more worker and labor-focused shows like ours, follow the link in the show notes and go check out the other great shows in our network. And please support the work that we're doing here at Working People, because we can't keep going Going without you. Share our episodes with your co workers, leave positive reviews of the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and become a paid monthly subscriber on Patreon for just five bucks a month to unlock all the great bonus episodes that we publish exclusively for our patrons. And please support the work that we do at The Real News by going to therealnews.com forward slash donate, especially if you want to see more reporting from the front lines of struggle around the U.S. and across the world. My name is Maximilian Alvarez, and I just wanted to pop in really quick to let folks know that, yes, I am alive, (laughs) and I appreciate the messages. Uh, I know folks were a little worried with me, you know, announcing in the last episode that I was finally going to East Palestine to be there in person, and then there was no episode from us the following week, but, uh, you know, if you've been following my updates on social media, last week, or if you happen to catch my face or voice on outlets like Democracy Now!, Breaking Points, The Nation, and The New Republic, then you know that I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off covering the this catastrophic shipping vessel crash that brought down the Francis Scott Key Bridge here in Baltimore, and that literally happened 24 freaking hours after I got home for to Baltimore from East Palestine. And, you know, I'm still trying to work with, you know, filmmaker Mike Bolonic uh, to get our documentary reports from East Palestine ready to go, too. And Jules and I will be putting out a compilation episode later this week that will include some of the voices from that incredible gathering that we had in East Palestine about a week and a half ago now. I mean, it was just such an incredible experience, you guys, and, and and I have so much more to say about it, but I'll save that for the next episode. For now, I'm just going to link to some of the interviews and, and pieces that I put out over the past week in the show notes of this episode, and instead of a new episode this week, we are going to share with y'all today an interview that I did with our brothers Adam and Jacob at the Valley Labor Report this weekend. And, you know, just a huge shout out to the Valley Labor Report. If you guys aren't listening to them yet, you know, what are you doing? Like, that's Alabama's only weekly union talk show right there. And we need them doing the good work that they're doing. So please go support them if you aren't already. But yeah, this this was the first interview that I got to do after this insane two-week stretch from East Palestine to the Baltimore Bridge. And I got to just reflect a bit on the story, the dimensions of tragedy and and the layers of societal failure that are wrapped up in this bridge collapse, the connections between Baltimore and East Palestine. And I also have a special message for all of these jack-off conspiracists and right-wing grifters who are trying to make this tragic story fit their dumb DEI or anti-DEI narrative. And in doing so, they are showing just how bankrupt their message is and how little they have to offer the working class when it comes to addressing the sources of the pain here, let alone addressing the larger issues that we need to deal with to stop stuff like the East Palestine train derailment and the Baltimore Bridge from happening in the first place. I mean, these guys are modern-day snake oil salesmen. And I have no time. These families of these workers who died on that bridge have no time. Our city has no time. And working people have no time for their bullshit. (sighs) Anyway, 
We've got lots more important coverage on Baltimore, East Palestine, Ohio, Palestine, the elections, and, you know, the, the fight against the corporate destruction of everything. We've got all of that coming your way here on Working People and across the Real News Network. So stay tuned. And for now, here's me speaking with Jacob Morrison and Adam Keller on the Valley Labor Report. Uh, have we got Max in the Zoom? I think we do have Max. Perfect. Yeah. So Maximilian Alvarez is the editor-in-chief of The Real News Network, host of the Working People podcast, friend of the show, voice of the show. <laughs> Thanks right. for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks for having me, brothers. Great to see you, as always. Great to see you. Um, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it is under these circumstances because the circumstances are not great. Uh, there has been uh, just a, a genuinely, you know, catastrophic accident in Baltimore uh, that has, um, by all accounts, taken at least six lives and, and six lives of immigrants. Um, and and I'm not sure if there are expectations that the death toll is, is going to be rising at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, on top of that, you know, the obvious and, and the thing that should be at the center, and, and we want to put that at the center, there are, of course, huge other ramifications because this bridge was really kind of the connecting artery to the Baltimore port that's one of the largest in the United States. The Longshoremen's Association there said that, that they are um, concerned that there's going that their 2400 members are going to be out of a job soon. Uh, uh, you know, boats are having to, you know, these cargo carriers are are anchoring outside of the port, unable to dock because they can't get their stuff, you know, what it would have gone across the bridge to the rest of the U.S. And so this is, you know, just a huge, huge situation um, with with really serious uh, uh, ramifications for the entire city of Baltimore. So just let, let's start there and then we can dive into some of the specific aspects and, and maybe some of the reactions to it. Um Generally, 30,000 foot view, how is this feeling to people in Baltimore as a resident of Baltimore yourself? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll walk through the timeline of this week, right? And, um, you know, and just to, to kind of let folks know, um, you know, it's been a very long week and I just got like, you know, more than five hours of sleep for the first night in like a week and a half. Um, so it's kind of all hitting me now. Like, you know, I was just along with our team at the real news racing all over the city, doing everything we could to meet the moment and, and uh, lift up the voices of the people who are going to be quickly forgotten in all of this. Right. And um, you know, the, the workers who perish, their families, their community, our community, uh, as you said, the the workers on the port, the workers on that ship who are probably going to be stuck there for weeks. And and there's another issue there about uh, if we're talking about invisible workers, you know, like these these immigrant construction workers who were filling potholes on the key bridge when uh, the ship, uh, the dolly hit the uh, load bearing pylon and collapsed the bridge. Um, you know, the workers on that ship, you know, are are, are also, you know, incredibly uh, exploited and we don't know a whole lot about them but what we do know is that you know like as as maritime trades uh union folks here in the states have told me i mean like you you have a lot of these ships that are effectively and i quote floating sweatshops that mm. workers from the global south are living on and working in and and have no escape from for months on end right so there there's a whole lot of horror tied up in this story that we're going to need to unpack for for you know the the weeks and months to come um but but as you said Jacob I mean like the 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 very fact of the bridge collapsing 
uh, in the port of Baltimore, I mean, is going to have, you know, huge ramifications for working people in the Baltimore area. But beyond it, too, it's going to have ramifications for our economy after workers have been, you know, battered for years by covid, by inflation and so on and so forth. So there, there, it, it, this is going to yeah be a very devastating event um, for the city and for our our, our people. Uh, for for a long time to come. But, you know, when I got I, I got back to Baltimore myself uh, at one thirty on Monday morning after driving, you know, uh, six hours back from East Palestine, Ohio, uh, where I had been <clears throat> for the previous five days running around filming for the real news, uh, participating in. Uh, an event that that you know we helped put together along with just this incredible coalition of folks that that have come together and came together there physically in East Palestine last Saturday, a week away, a week from today. We're talking East Palestine residents who have been, you know, like uh, whose lives have been turned upside down by the catastrophic Norfolk Southern train derailment on February third of last year. That too was a preventable catastrophe. Um, and, you know, the the workers there, the people there, these are current and former union members uh, like Chris Albright, the the one of the, the residents that I've been working most closely with and have gotten close to with his and, and his family. He's an incredible guy, beautiful family. You know, he was an oil. Uh, he was a gas pipeline worker. Uh, he was a foreman. He was a Layuna member, is a Layuna member. Mm. And then a month after the derailment, you know, uh, like. We can we can almost, you know, completely surmise, but because of all the like legal deniability, like, you know, doctors are even afraid to say for sure. But a month after this derailment, a healthy, able body pipeline worker um, was experiencing congestive heart failure that developed into severe heart failure. Um, and he can no longer work. His medical bills are piling up. He, as of this year, he's lost his health insurance. So like these folks are are in an incredibly dire situation. And we were there along with residents, railroad workers, uh, residents from other sacrifice zones like Piketon, Ohio, where they've been getting poisoned by a nuclear plant for 40 years. Um, you know, residents living near other rail lines saying we don't want this to happen to us. And like we're coming here to stand in solidarity with you. Striking journalists from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, environmental groups, people from West Virginia, California, Baltimore, like coming in to assemble there to answer the call in East Palestine and say, like, you're not Trump voters. You know, we're not we're not anything but fellow workers, fellow human beings who are fighting for our families and our communities. And we are here to help you. And we want to stand with you. But we all need to stand together if we're going to stop this crap because it's happening all over the country. It doesn't matter if you're in a Democrat or Republican state. Corporate America is poisoning, exploiting, and taking advantage, taking advantage of all of us right now. And we are the kind of forgotten victims of this, you know, 40 plus year reign of uh, corporate uh, oligarchy and, you know, like neoliberal crap. Um, that that has like contributed to the decades long process of the Wall Street takeover of, uh, you know, vital industries like the railroads, um, the the profit minded, um, you know, uh, the profit obsession um, le leading to like a, a, a an obsession, an obsession for juicing short term profits while stripping away long term maintenance and safety provisions, stripping away staff, cutting costs, cutting corners every year. Uh, and the railroads are more profitable than they've ever been. And yet mm. communities like East Palestine and workers like those on the railroads are the ones paying the price. I promise I'm getting to Baltimore. But like the point is, is that's what I was doing this weekend. And I drove back, you know, on Sunday night, got home late Monday morning, thinking about all of this, thinking about those conversations, thinking about our brothers and sisters in East Palestine. And then uh, the first thing I did on Tuesday morning was I went on Flash Forenses show, America's Workforce. Shout out to Flash and the great folks there. I know you guys got a phenomenal regular spot there, too. Chris Albright and I went back on Flash's show Tuesday morning, like at seven in the morning to talk about the East Palestine Conference. And as soon as that was done, I started learning about the bridge. Mm. Um, and the first text that I started getting 
about the bridge were from East Palestine residents who felt really connected and feel really connected to Baltimore right now. And there's something really powerful in that, but we can return to that later. But, you know, they were seeing a lot of uh, eerie resonances with what they had been through. I couldn't help but see them too. And I want to be clear, as I said in, in the piece I wrote for The Nation this week, like Baltimore is not East Palestine. These situations are not exactly the same, but they do, I think, uh, reveal like common issues that working people around this country are feeling. And the 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 sources of those issues uh, uh, we also have in common, right? Because you know what? As we know, I'll, I mean, I'll get I'll get to that in a second. But as we know, um, and as you said, like basically at one thirty, around one thirty on on Tuesday morning, um, this this um, uh, uh, ship, the freight ship that was um, leaving the port of Baltimore, uh, had left. You know, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes um, prior to experiencing a catastrophic propulsion failure. Um, issuing uh, the captain, you know, like, or the pilot on that ship, you know, like that, who is uh, a, an American um, designated official who is supposed to uh, help uh, ships navigate their way out of the port, to Bal port of Baltimore. Um, they issued a mayday call when they experienced that failure. Um, uh, letting the, the emergency dispatch know that there was a chance that the ship could hit the bridge. Uh, and then they had about 90 seconds to respond. And so, you know, police, you can listen to the police scanner, uh, the folks responding to that call, racing to the key bridge, blocking traffic. So more people uh, didn't drive onto that bridge before it collapsed and credit to them. They saved lives. Um, but, you know, like the workers, the construction workers who were filling potholes on that bridge in the middle of the night, um, we're, we're working for a contractor in the city named Bronner Builders. It's a non-union contractor. Um, you know, they did not get a warning. Or, I mean, like by all accounts, we, we have not found any evidence that they got any warning. And that's kind of where like my reporting in this, you know, came in is um, after the America's Workforce interview, uh, you know, I went to the Real News Network. I, I was talking to our colleagues, our team about, you know, what we knew and what we could do. Um, two of my amazing colleagues, Kayla Rivara and Jocelyn Dombrowski, our, our um, chief of editorial operations and our managing editor. We just we got in the car. I grabbed my podcast stuff and I said, let, 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 let's go and, and try to get as close as we can. And so we ended up at this Royal Farms gas station. It's a really famous kind of Maryland chain um, Tuck, uh, uh, Justin Tucker, the kicker for the Baltimore Ravens does the commercials for them. So, uh, I was standing there with my colleagues and, you know, seeing media run around, uh, at, at this Royal farms that is like right next to the ent one of the entrances to the bridge. And, uh, we were racing there because we had seen on social media that a man named Jesus Campos was there. Jesus, also works for Bronner Builders, uh, is also an immigrant uh, worker, construction worker, uh, who, you know, was saying that he knew the men on that bridge. So we were mm -hmm. racing primarily to meet him. And we did. And I got to interview Jesus for, you know, between three and four minutes. Um, but it was really troubling to me because the whole time we were racing there, and uh, I was trying to find out everything I could about the situation. I was looking at uh, the posts and, and articles from other journalists who had spoken to Jesus. And when we got there, I asked him a question that I felt I hadn't heard anyone else ask it up until that point. Uh, I'm not saying no one did, but I hadn't heard it, which was, you know, did the workers get a warning um, before the, the bridge collapsed? And he told me pretty, pretty uh, point blankly, no. Um, and that to me, you know, is is a, an egregious injustice. Right. And there's so many questions, again, that are wrapped up in that, like how in the hell could we end up in a situation where workers doing this essential work, um, contracting with the state? 
Um, and the, and those contracts are supposed, especially in construction, are supposed to mandate um, are, are, are prevailing union wages. Um, and, you know, again, this is not a, a union contractor. So far, what I've heard from other construction folks in the city is that Bronner like doesn't have the worst reputation. So like I don't want to speak out of turn and and blame the company for everything before I can do more investigating. But you know, the 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 facts are that it's a non-union contractor, that the state of Maryland, like states around the country, um, you know, like uh uh, uh use these sort of these uh, contractors and those contractors subcontract workers out. And that very well could have been the situation on Tuesday where some of these workers were, you know, subcontracted, um, being paid under the table, possibly even undocumented. Again, these are the questions that we're trying to find out. But right now, uh, first and foremost, we're trying to give the family space because they are grieving an incredible mm-hmm. and impossible loss. Some of these men just welcome new children into their family. Mm-hmm in the past year and now those families have a hole in it that'll never be filled so anyway i'm i'm i'll, I'll wrap this up the the point being is that i interviewed jesus campos you know i i i posted about the fact that according to uh, one of the co-workers of these men uh, who died on the bridge, they did not receive uh, a warning. Um, if they were, you know, city workers, if they were union workers, um, would they have had a direct line to emergency dispatch? Uh, if not, why the hell do we have uh, a, a regulatory regime that allows workers to be marooned on a ship like that in a clearly potentially hazardous environment? Doing that vital work, and con- let's not forget, construction's already one of the deadliest jobs in America, uh, and they had no direct line to emergency dispatch in case something like this happened. Like, that in itself is an egregious injustice. And the only other thing I'll say, just tying it back to East Palestine, is, like, again, these situations are not the same, but a lot of the common, like, uh, questions are coming up. Uh, like, with Norfolk Southern and the train derailment, like, you know, the, the when, when that derailment happened, right? Immediately you had all of these like, you know, well-to-do pundits in the United States saying like, well, you know, we can't rush to conclusions. All we know is that it appears to be a bearing failure that that caused the derailment. So that's all we can say on it right now. Just like mm-hmm. the same folks today are saying, well, all we know is that it was a propulsion failure, so we can't rush to conclusions. And I'm not rushing to conclusions. We need to do the investigative work. Like that's what journalism is supposed to do. But Again, the the point that I'm making here and the point that seems so obvious to not just me, but folks in East Palestine and folks who've been paying attention to things like East Palestine, to things like Boeing, right, to things like BP, right? I mean, like what to the railroads, right? I mean, like what we are seeing is like a fracturing of the basic social contract in this country, which was, you know, like supposed to be between the citizens, labor, business and government to say, like, look, all of this like dangerous, uh, you know, crap that is that and machinery that is operating in our backyards, in our communities, these railroads that are running through our backyards and our towns, right? These sh- massive uh, uh, um, shipping vessels that are passing by our homes and over our the water that we use in this in this uh, city, like we the social contract is that like we need to have. Uh, layers of protection and maintenance in place that are not driven by profit, but that are there and exist solely to ensure that things like this don't happen. So the very fact of the bridge collapse, the very fact of the Norfolk Southern train derailment, the very fact of the two Boeing planes that went out of the sky and killed hundreds of people uh, with them, the very fact of the BP oil spill, and I could go on and on and on, like that is the problem. Like if we had a healthily functioning regulation regulatory system, if we actually had a society that did not allow corporations to do whatever the hell that they want, like those things would not happen in the first place. That is the problem. Right, right. And, and you know, the, I mean, some of the echoes, you know, the lever has been doing great reporting and, and you know, they do, they, they were really great on the East Palestine stuff as well. Uh, they found that the company that chartered this car- cargo ship um, also uh, uh, was, um, 
sanctioned by the Labor Department for retaliating against an employee who reported unsafe working conditions. Uh, in its order, the department found that Maersk had a policy that requires employees to first report their concerns to Maersk prior to reporting it to the Coast Guard or other authorities. Um, and I, it seemed like, I can't find it right now, but was that same ship involved in another accident? Yeah, so I believe it was in 2016 in Antwerp. Um, mm. The the ship um, didn't have like a catastrophic accident, but it did like you can see pictures of it online where it like ran into a concrete siding in the port of Antwerp. Um, and then the the other detail that is worth looking at was I believe it was last year uh, the ship was sighted in in a port in Chile um, for having propulsion issues. Right. Um, but, you know, what what the company and what, you know, uh, um, people of a certain disposition will point out is that, you know, the ship did also receive, uh, you know, a passing grade here in the U.S. I believe the last one was in September. Right. So, like, again, there's a lot to sort of unpack here because. Like, uh, again, one side is going to try to kind of do what they always do, what they did in East Palestine and everywhere else, is they're going to try to say that this is a contained freak accident that couldn't have been avoided, or like, you know, if it did, like, here are the unique circumstances that led to this contained um, and unique catastrophic incident. But we, like, know better, right, because if you actually spend your time interviewing the working people who live in work around these sites, right, whether they be railroad lines or whether they be ports uh, or whether they be just folks like living in the, the city, right, and 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 know what goes on there and, and are affected by it, right? Like there's, there's a larger question here about like how we ended up in a situation where a clearly, you know, like a situation where like something that should have been caught, some a ship that never should have been uh, able to leave port, especially carrying as many hazardous materials as it was uh, th that some of which are reportedly, according to Business Insider, sitting in the in the in the water right now in the Patapsco mm. River. That's what that's what folks in East Palestine were also like saying this, like how many of those containers fell into the water? Like, again, right. They are going through something similar where they're being told by Norfolk Southern, by their own government and government agencies like the EPA, everything's fine. You guys are fine. Go back on, go back to your regular lives and stop bothering us. Meanwhile, you know, myself and and uh, Mike Balonic, this this great working class uh, director and videographer who I was shooting in East Palestine with, like we were standing in the creeks behind people's houses in East Palestine with Christina Seisloff, a single mom who lives in like the, the sticks in Pennsylvania, who is also getting like all these health ailments. She's been out there, you know, like with, you know, like, like a Creek Ranger with a few other folks documenting the fact that those waters still are not safe. And she showed us like, if you just turn a shovel over, you'll see it's like ghosts coming out of the water. Mm -hmm. Those chemicals that we saw uh, on top of the water a year ago, they're still there, right? And so obviously East Palestine folks are telling us like, you need to find out what was in those containers and like, you need to get them out of the water as soon as possible. So that's another issue. But again, right. the whole point is like, this did not happen overnight. We are experiencing across this country, right? The, 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 the chickens are coming home to roost. It feels after 40 plus years of corporate dominance, deregulation, disinvestment, the devaluation of labor and life itself, right? That stuff starts to add up and all of it plays a role to the point where we don't care enough about the workers on that bridge to even ask, do they have a direct line to emergency dispatch? We don't mm -hmm. care enough about the workers in that port to ask like, you know, are you guys getting enough time to do your job properly? We don't care enough about the workers on those ships to ask, like, are you guys getting enough time and are you getting paid enough? Are you getting what you need to ensure that you are navigating these vessels as safely as you need to be when they are passing in our own backyard? Right. I mean, like these the, like to say nothing of what's on the ships, you know, like the, the amount of regulation, the kind of security checks like 
there there are so many resonances here with like what I'm seeing in other industries and I'm not jumping to conclusions and saying I know exactly like the source of this failure but again I you can't do the work that we do and talk to people around this country who are experiencing similar things and not see the the the, the connections here um so that's kind of where we are right now I mean like again like everyone's sort of racing to to talk about um, what this is going to mean for the economy. Um, there's just a rash of conspiracy theories like floating around there. Uh, you know, like people are already kind of racing past, right, the, the the six men who died on that bridge. Eight fell into the water that we know of. Two were recovered that morning, one of whom, you know, went to the hospital. The other reportedly refused emergency services. And like I immediately because if you know undocumented people and construction workers, your conclusion when you hear that is like, oh, they were uninsured or, or undocumented right. or both. Um, but I was watching white anchors and newscasters here in the city say, oh, I guess that person must have just been fine and walked away. And like that's the kind of situation we're in where like the the, the these in workers who were already basically invisible to our society have only become momentarily visible in death. And yet, and this is happening at a time when Donald Trump, one of the two leading like presidential candidates in this country, leading one of the two major parties, could be president again. He's out there saying that immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country and people are believing it. I've been I, I went on Democracy Now and like made a passionate plea to people to like, please see us as human beings, for God's sake, because while you're out there saying that we're criminals and rapists and, and like we're coming to destroy the country and we're sucking all the government money out. This is what we're actually doing. We're working right. at night, filling your pothole so that, you know, you could have a good drive to work and we can put food on the table for our families. Like I just had an incredible podcast conversation yesterday in a Mexican restaurant in town, El Taquito Mexicano in Fells Point, where I met with like a, an incredible group of um, heads of different like Latino and immigrant justice or community orgs in in the uh, city. I mean, these are folks who who you know the media in the city barely ever talks to or acknowledges at all. Um, so they themselves are also operating in the shadows and they're doing their best to fight for a community that is basically invisible, not just here in Baltimore, but around the country. And they are also working people who have families, who have multiple jobs. Some have like children with special needs. And yet I was sitting at this table of superheroes talking in English and Spanish about like how they have been mobilizing to support the families, how, how, you know, what this says about the way that our community is treated and, and like what we were all feeling as people who are being vilified in this country, even though, you know, we're just trying to make a life for our families. And even though, even in death, right, we can't achieve the dignity that, that every human being deserves. Um, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where it is right now. Yeah, that that is really uh, indicting on those reporters that that assumed and said on the air that that oh that means they're okay. I mean that's that's wild to me that that they would believe that and say that uh, that it's. Uh, I mean, well, just, it's an I, even I bigger remember. indictment on our country, right? Because right. I, again, I want to confirm this, but just to say, like, when I was talking to the folks last night and I asked, I was like, was that person sin papeles? You know, do we know? And they, 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 we, again, we, we want to learn more details about the family, but like, what, uh, like, I was told was like, he had no health insurance. So, like, in this fucking country, just sit with that. Sorry for swearing. In this country, no. people, like, imagine. Being a worker, a construction worker, filling potholes at night, a bridge collapses beneath your feet. You fall into the cold waters of the Patapsco River. Your coworkers are dying around you, right? You don't know if you're going to make it out alive. And, and reportedly, one, if not both of these workers could not swim. We know that one of them mm -hmm. could not. You're rescued from the water and you refuse the offer to go to the hospital because you live in America and you don't have health insurance after going through what I have to imagine is one of the most traumatic experiences of your life. You are worried about the cost of that health care that you desperately need. Like that is an indictment on our country. Right. Absolutely. And Absolutely. East Palestinians right now don't have health care. 
That is an indictment on our country. That's why we're trying to get Biden to invoke the Stafford Act and and guarantee these folks government funded health care because their ailments and bills are piling up like what? What a horrendous state for our country to be in. And when are we going to like band together as a class across political lines, union, non-union, whatever? Like, when are we going to start banding together and say, like, this is not good enough. We will be forgotten no more. And we deserve health care. We deserve to be able to drink our water and to, for our children to breathe the air without getting nosebleeds or cancer. Right. I mean, this is how bad things have gotten. So hopefully that kicks us in the ass enough to stop pitting ourselves against each other and seeing one another as the enemy, whether they're the Trump, you know, voters in East Palestine or immigrant workers like the folks on this bridge. Like if we can get past that crap, we can actually make change happen. We can be the change that we're waiting for. But I don't know what we're waiting for right now, because look around you. Things are really dire and people are suffering. Right. And that's and, and it's absurd to not kind of look to uh, the state of things for an answer as to why this happened in East Palestine or in, in Baltimore, just like we did as things initially started breaking in East Palestine because of, uh, you know, just because the 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 boat passed an inspection doesn't mean that uh you know everything was great i mean we've seen the state uh through multiple examples the state of our uh regulatory system and how it's kind of falling apart at the seams and it is not catching the things that it's set up to catch um and and so yeah, that, it, that was that, the defense yeah. Of Norfolk Southern right. was like we were we were complying with all regulations and then it's then people could either you have a decision to make there. You could either say, oh, okay, well then I guess it was fine. Or you say, like, how bad are our regulations if right, that was right. okay? Right? right? If that right. train carrying that many hazardous materials that no one knew, like, or like very people very few people actually knew what was on that train. And not only that, but I mean, like, again, the hot box detectors that picked that picked up the the ambient rise and heat of the bearing, like, you know miles away from East Palestine like that. Those hot box right. detectors are not regulated by the government. They're regulated by the companies. The company decides what the threshold is to, to like, if it gets above this heat, then, you know, like we'll relay it to the dispatch office and they'll relay it to the crew on the train. Like that's another like uh, example of like what deregulation like looks like where those layers of security are stripped away and the company's profit motive is like driving the decisions that are made. And this, and this is what happens. So like, you're absolutely right, Jacob, the, the problem uh, one of the many problems with East Palestine and with this is like not that uh, the 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 this ship or that train were were up to code. It's that the code is not up to the right. right standard, right? I mean, because those codes have been watered down, and government negligent government officials have let companies do it for years on end. Democrats and Republicans have participated right. in this. And the, you know, and it's like the, the FAA paying Boeing employees to do the FAA's job in certain instances. You know, I mean, it's all just it's all just a mess. Uh, but, the, you know, that's a that's a good segue to East Palestine and your uh, conference or convention that y'all had uh, last week to uh, uh, ask Joe Biden to, to call on Joe Biden to invoke um, uh, an act that would give uh, people in East Palestine health care to Tell us the act and the authority that, that Joe Biden has there um, and the event that y'all had last week and, and, and how it went and, and what are some of the next steps. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I just want to, by way of bridging the two, I want to um, let folks know, uh, again, I talked to these incredible uh, organizers and, and pillars of the Latino community here in Baltimore last night. Um, they were the ones who started the original GoFundMe. That was the Latino Racial Justice Circle, uh, which, you know, again, these are all volunteers, right? But they started that GoFundMe for the families of the six brothers that uh, we lost this week. Um, but they were, you know, I think one silver lining, one ray of hope is that they were 
quickly overwhelmed by the response, right? So even though part of the country is demonizing us, the response from people wanting to help, wanting to show solidarity from East Palestine to around the country, you know, the fact that that the Latino racial justice circle had to like close the GoFundMe because they were getting so many donations that they were worried, like they wanted to be fully transparent. They wanted to make sure that the families got all every ounce of that money. So like they made the, the decision to essentially work with the city to offload that fundraiser. And now that fundraiser is being run through the city. So if folks want to donate to um, that fund for the families of the Key Bridge Six, um, it is there on the uh, Baltimore City's website. I've also posted it uh, online. Uh, I can share it with you guys after this interview. But if you want to help, that is one way that you can. Uh, same goes for East Palestine. Again, like one of the reasons that we are uh, this coalition, this this uh, new coalition that's formed called Justice for East Palestine Residents and Workers, right? This is this has come out of you know a year's worth of you know folks like me, but not just me. There's the East Palestine Unity Council. There are residents, you know, like across the East Palestine who are not part of the Unity Council. There are railroad workers. There were union reps, um, mainly local and regional, including like local presidents who came there and were not permitted to speak on behalf of their unions, but who were saying, I'm here anyway, because this is what's right. Right. And therein lies another issue like labor needs to get off its ass and get and start helping East Palestine. Like these are your brothers and sisters. Again, like one of the, Jamie Wallace from the Unity Council, she's a former SEIU member. Chris Albright is a Lyuna member. Darren Gamble, who I've also interviewed, is a retired bricklayer, right? I mean, these are our brothers and sisters, and they are dying. Their families have been poisoned by this crap. And like, again, like they were exposed to chemicals in that in that unnecessary and catastrophic derailment and the decision to vent and burn five cars worth of vinyl chloride, which the manufacturer of that vinyl chloride said was not necessary. But what we all suspect, Norfolk Southern pressured local officials to make the decision to vent and burn those contents, not because the contents were going to explode and there was going to be shrapnel going for miles around, but because they wanted to clear the way and get those rail lines open again because they're a massive moneymaker. I saw those trains going through like every 20 minutes when I was standing in East Palestine, right? So, I mean, like, again, I say that um, that exposure to those chemicals, um, you know, even if, like, those chemicals have dissipated since then, uh, like, a lot of it is still in the soil. A lot of it is still in the water. I could taste the metallic taste in my mouth when I was standing near Chris Albright's house. When I was standing, it got worse when I stood next to the derailment site. Uh, you get a sort of mouth numbness. Like, people are still in their homes, like, racking up uh, bizarre ailments, like really unique ailments. It has all the hallmarks of an industrial poisoning accident, like Three Mile Island or, or anything like that. And we're going to see the effects in the bodies of these people over the coming years. And yet, again, the country's just moved on. Um, Biden finally got there in February of this year and basically said, you're welcome for delivering for you. Bye. Like Norfolk Southern is out there telling people you're not going to get another dime from us. Like they they're they're cutting people off from this aid and they're like the, what they're doing there is so despicable. And I need people out there watching this to care about it. Right. Because what I told people in East Palestine is and what what our our coalition really represents is that it's. And, and again, I know this because I talk to workers around the country, as you guys do. I said it's not that working people have forgotten about you. It's that so many people feel just as forgotten as you do, right? I mean, I just interviewed Brett Cross, uh, uh, another, you know, fellow worker, another uh, gas worker in Texas, uh, who was also a father and his son Uzi was one of the children murdered in the school shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, right? His community feels just as forgotten as East Palestine does, right? I interviewed one of the workers, uh, you know, who was on, Leo Linder, who was on the Deepwater Horizon when it blew, you know, over 10 years ago in the Gulf. That community feels forgotten. It feels like that the devastation from that feels as forgotten by the country as anything else, right? 
we need to band together as a coalition of the forgotten, right? The the forgotten workers on strike, like the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette workers or the Warrior Met coal strikers who we both tried to cover throughout their two plus year strike, right? I mean, workers who have been uh, like the Latino uh, organizers told me yesterday, right? A lot of work, immigrant workers in this community are still uh, and, and are going to keep being impacted by COVID, right? I mean, people are dealing with long COVID because they were working in uh you know conditions where they didn't have the kind of protections and if they were undocumented um they did not have access to like the stimulus checks and like the unemployment benefits so they had to go to work they got sick a lot died a lot are still getting sick right they feel just as forgotten as east palestine does and as we're worried baltimore will be and baltimore has been forgotten for so many years i mean this city's been losing population for decades we've been disinvested from right the police have been brutalizing us and again this is all, we're all kind of feeling this stuff, right? And yet the people who are ripping us off, the people uh, in the 1% whose wealth has like grown by astronomical amounts in the past 10 years alone from Donald Trump's tax cuts to the ways that we like essentially uh, uh, handed the economy over to billionaires throughout the course of COVID, like the bosses are winning, the oligarchs are winning and they are busy pitting us against each other and telling folks like the working people in East Palestine that people like me and the men on that bridge are their enemy instead of the people who like Alan Shaw, right, who are raking in profits from all of the cost cutting and corner cutting that they're doing on the railroads, right? So like, that's where the work that we do, that's where the work that all of us does has to come in. Like we have to fight back. We have to find each other on the basic human levels, not as socialist, Republican, union, non-union, Democrat, Republican, whatever, right? We need to find each other on that level of just basic humanity, right? You know, human beings, fellow workers, fellow neighbors, people who want to provide for our families, breathe clean air, drink clean water, be left alone so we can enjoy our one time around on this uh, earth with our family, like not have to work every day, every hour of our day just to put food on the table, right? I mean, like those are the kind that we, things have gotten so bad that those are the most basic common foundations upon which we need to unite. But if we do, I promise you all, we can actually win and we can make real change happen. Right. And and just and just to wrap it up as it, it, maybe, um, you know, I don't know, I was going to say that this may be a, a lighter note to end on because it's just so, so stupid. But also it's kind of a dark note because you alluded to some of the some of the propaganda that's been going around uh, uh, going around around the situation. Um, and that's the attempt to shoehorn the kind of anti DEI stuff. Uh, into this Baltimore bridge collapse, just like they have been around the stuff with Boeing and and uh, you know uh, every time now that you see a story about uh, corporate malfeasance and you know the destruction destruction of the regulatory state that results in uh, totally preventable uh, disasters and accidents and deaths and injuries. Uh, there is some crazy. Uh, conservative commentator coming out and saying well that's what happens when you hire black people and it's just it's astounding that they're able to just come out and say that i mean the the mayor of baltimore and i'm i i don't know how you feel about the mayor of baltimore i have i have no idea anything about him and you know because of i i know how you feel about politicians generally i'm, I'm sure probably you're not a fan i don't know but the he came out and did a press conference and there were people on Twitter talking about this is Baltimore's DEI mayor. He's like, they're just saying the N word. That's just what DEI means now. And then Charlie Kirk uh, has been doing this thing about, oh, well, you know, I'm not saying it was DEI, but I'm just saying it's important that we get rid of DEI as I'm talking about this. Dave Rubin did the same thing, reacting uh, by reminding us that we need to, quote, hire the best people to build our stuff. And that once you allow, allow wokeness in, bad things happen. Um, and it's just astounding their willingness to shoehorn this stuff in where it clearly reveals their bigotry. And and so yeah, I'm just interested in, in how you've been taking in the 
reactions like that as you've seen this unfold? You save this one for the last question. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm about to yell for another hour. I mean, but real quick, I uh, before I get there, I just want to say before I go on this rant uh, to anyone out there listening, because I know, uh, you know, we got a lot of union brothers and sisters listening to this great show. Please support the Valley Labor Report. We need shows like this. Um, right. Because this, you guys are not unconnected from what we're talking about here. Right. It's because like the contracting and subcontracting relationship and the way that profit seeking businesses and and sleazy contractors exploit that is the exact same reason we find brown children working in Hyundai parts distributors over there in Alabama or right. cleaning mm -hmm. bone saws in meatpacking plants in the Midwest or working in slave conditions in farms and picking the tomatoes for our Wendy's cheeseburgers in places like Florida, right? So this connects all of us. And if you are in a union, right, you need to do what Labor's Local 79, a construction union in New York is doing, not seeing like like their fellow workers, immigrant workers, returning citizens from prison, right? Undocumented people, the people that non-union contractors target and exploit the most, they are not quote unquote, taking your jobs. Again, they're like the men on these bridge. They're like people working around you so often. They're trying to make a life for themselves. They're living in the shadows and they are being exploited and abused because they do not have the full legal right to representation. They do not have a union contract. They need your help. They are not your mm. enemy. That is what Labor's Local 79 has realized. And that's why they are working to organize those folks. They are reaching out to them. They helped start a COVID relief fund for undocumented people who couldn't get benefits from the state, right? Because if you organize them, you take the bosses like leverage out of their hand where they always have like a cheaper form of labor. You guys were just on uh, the great Mansa Musha show, rattling the bars here at the Real News Network, talking about how the fact that corporations, private and government agencies are exploiting slave prison labor to mm. undercut costs. They're doing that to all of us like if you're a working person like these companies these corporations and even our own government they are the ones who are creating this multi-tier labor system where you have like prison slave labor at the bottom you know like undocumented under the table uh labor you know like just above that you know intern labor i mean they've created so many layers of of labor that create resentment within our own ranks that right. make us see each other as the enemy like that's how they're winning guys so so please don't take the bait. Please see this in the larger uh, picture. And also, um, if you are listening to this and you want to get involved in the coalition that is that is growing out of East Palestine and you want to join the campaign to pressure President Biden to invoke the Stafford Act, issue a federal disaster declaration for East Palestine, because that's the kind of thing that presidents do when, you know, when there are hurricanes. Governor Wes Moore just declared an emergency here because of the bridge collapse. Right. You unlock a lot of resources, federal and state, that people in East Palestine desperately need right now. And in fact, Governor Mike DeWine has finally, you know, like last year, like sent a request to President Biden to issue a disaster declaration and Biden won't do it. So like mm. it, it's only going to happen if like a, a rank and file movement of people, union, non-union, environmental groups, everything else pressure him and like join this call to say, invoke the Stafford Act, declare EP a disaster, get these people health care. And I suspect one of the main reasons Biden won't do that is because if he does, then there are going to be a whole lot of communities around the country that are like, hey, we're in the same boat. You know, I mentioned Piketon, Ohio, where the nuclear plant is. They should get like, I mean, like they have like a different situation, but like there are communities like that that still need help. People are still dying of cancers and weird ailments like that's what we're fighting for in East Palestine. Now to quickly jump to the morons and cowards who are out here like spinning their BS conspiracy theories amidst this tragedy here in Baltimore. I mean, I went on breaking points yesterday to make this point. I said it on Democracy Now! Like, stop being a coward. If you like, I'm not, we're not going to reach those, those morons like Charlie Kirk. They are disinformation and division merchants. That is the whole point of what they do. Right. So like, I'm not hoping to reach them. I'm hoping to reach the fellow workers who are being poisoned by that crap. Right. And the people who, you know, like are again, 
being led by their most cowardly impulses to, you know, like fabricate these ridiculous explanations when the reality is much more horrifying and it's staring you right in the face. We can confront that together. We don't need to shy away from it. We don't need to come up with these, you know, like ridiculous boogeymen uh, to try to explain what should be patently obvious, which is, again, the regulatory capture, the corporate capture of our entire system, the speed ups, the the, the the relentless thirst for profit, uh, the stripping away of safety and maintenance, the devaluation of labor and life, like all of this is creating the conditions where things like the Baltimore Bridge collapsing and the East Palestine derailment are going to be happening a lot more. That is the problem. But what I would just say as someone who grew up conservative, as someone who used to think like people like Charlie Kirk think, I used to buy into that. If I had not gone the way that I have to end up being the lefty nut job I am today, I would probably be out there saying the same things right now. I have like right-wing Latinos yelling at me for quote unquote pushing a narrative this week. And I'm like, bro, I used to think like you, your mentality is nothing new to me. I hope you see the light someday. But like, you know, a lot of people are too far gone into that thing. But what I would just say as someone who has made that journey from conservative, deep red conservative to deep red lefty, over the course of my life is that when I see that, what I see is that they are playing you. Republicans, the right, have been the ones since I was born pushing for all this deregulation, all this disinvestment, all of this like, oh, we got to we got to like, you know, let corporations serve their shareholders and not, and not the public, because then like, you know, the invisible hand of the market will will bring us prosperity. We got to keep cutting the taxes of the rich and the wealthy. We got to keep stripping away these regulations like we got to keep disciplining labor and, and breaking unions. And now that same right is trying to turn around 40 years later and say like, oh, diversity is the problem. DEI is the problem. Immigrants are the problem. Fuck you. Like I grew up listening to your lies. I grew up believing the crap that you were pushing. And now you all on the right, especially people like Charlie Kirk and even people like, you know, people I work with. Like, I mean, like, I'm not even going to call out more names. Like, again, I went on breaking points yesterday. I mentioned Sagar by name. I want to have a conversation. I'm not saying Sagar is Charlie Kirk, but like there's a whole right wing discourse machine here that is contributing to this crap. And it is it is not going to help working people. And I believe believe and i think it's patently obvious having seen you know having grown up in this world and this ideology that the right is just trying to cover its ass the right is trying to distract us from the fact that they have helped create and in fact they have been a, the driving force creating the conditions that are leading to our communities being in this dire state over 40 years they don't want you to know that they want you to think that they're the populace on our side and that the problem is dei that's not right. the problem dei for corporate Corporations like this, it's just another money-making scheme. That's why corporations lean into DEI so hard, because it's a way to pretend like they're doing something to uh, satiate, you know, like uh, calls for diversity. It's a low lift, low budget investment that can make companies seem more woke, more conscientious, but it really doesn't require them at all to change their business or their labor practices in the least, right? They can keep doing what they're doing while pretending that like, you know, they're, they're more conscientious employers. That's why so many companies like just lean into the DEI stuff because they, they take very little risk in doing so. So what you're actually mad at is not the diversity. You're mad again at the core corporate oligarchs who are playing you and playing us and trying to cover their own ass for what they have done to our country for 40 plus, 100 plus, 200 plus years. So eventually we got to wise up to this. Otherwise, they're going to destroy everything we hold dear. They are in the midst of destroying the very planet that we live on. And we don't have time to waste fighting about DEI right now. So get serious, get involved or get out of our way. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, amen, brother. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You were talking about, you know, this has been going on for 10, 20, 30, 100, 200 years. You might even say something like the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. But um, you might. You, know, maybe you could you say might. that. You might, you might would say that. Uh, Max Alvarez, uh, really appreciate it. Always great. Uh, people should um, uh, subscribe and read the Real News Network, listen to the Working People podcast. Uh, watch the art of class war on breaking points um max thank you so much for your time i appreciate it
Thank you, brothers. Always a pleasure. Love yes, from sir. love and solidarity from Baltimore.